Aum. Tavat Satyam Jagad Bhati Shukti Karajatang Yata Yavanna Gnayate Brahma Sarvadishtana Madvayam Tavat as a correlative of Yavat as long as Satyang true Jagat the world Bhati appears Shuktika Rajatang silver in the mother of pearl Yata like Yavat as a relative of Tavat as long as Na not Nyayate is realized. Brahma, Brahman, Sarva Adishtanang, the substratum for all. Advayam, one without a second. The world appears to be real, like the illusion of silver in an oyster shell, only as long as the non dual Brahman, the basis of all, is not known. Namaste. And welcome to the seventh text of Atma Bodha. This text reinforces the basic message of non-duality, that as long as we don't know the non-dual reality, we accept the dualistic illusion as real. And the last text, it was likened to waking up from a dream. And in this text, the example is mother of pearl. If you see an oyster shell on the beach or at the market, sometimes they're sold as ashtrays. <laughs> but if you look at it, it looks very beautiful. It looks like silver and sometimes has beautiful shades of blue and other colors mixed into it. The cover photo for this video is a shot of an oyster shell, just in case you're not familiar with it. It's also called mother of pearl. If you're not familiar with these English terms, uh, you can just look at the cover photo and see. The silver appears to be in the lining of the oyster shell. But if you go and, and, you know, chip it away and analyze a chemical sample of it, it's not really silver. It's some organic compound deposited on the inside of the shell. In the same way, you know, the example of the rope and snake. When one comes out in the twilight or in the dark and sees a rope, one may think, oh, that's a snake. That's a great example because it's clear. There is no relationship between the rope and the observed snake. The snake is totally imaginary. It has nothing to do with the real rope. And similarly, the case of silver in the mother of pearl. It's also called nacre. I think, in French. There is no silver there. The silver is only in our minds, and it's projected, overlaid, or superimposed on the real thing, which is simply an oyster shell. So in the same way, you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> this material world is an illusory array of names and forms superimposed on Brahman, which is the substrate of all. So, there's a good question you can ask yourself when you see the world, and it apparently looks real. It seems real because it affects our senses. Our senses, of course, are made of the same stuff. And it's a well-known problem in philosophy, an ancient problem going back at least to the ancient Greeks, if not further. 
that it is impossible to logically prove that the world is real. Why is that? Because there is no other world to compare it to. Or if there is another world, you see, Indian philosophy goes even further, or I should say Vedic philosophy, goes further and say, well, there is another world, the spiritual world or the world of Brahman. And in comparison with the world of Brahman, the world of matter is unreal because it's temporary, it's changeable, it's mutable, and Brahman is not. Brahman never changes throughout all eternity. So as long as Brahman is not known, this world appears real because it's the only world we've got. But then when we come in contact with a higher reality, a more real reality, because it's permanent, unchanging, then by comparison, the material world appears insubstantial. Just like the snake. Huh? What makes the snake appear real? It's our memories. We have some memories of snakes or of people telling us about snakes. And when we see the rope, which sort of resembles a snake in form, those memories come up and we say, oh, maybe it's a snake. And if it's dark and we can't see clearly, maybe we start to imagine that it's a snake. It really is a snake. huh? And one really becomes afraid. Just like if you have a bad dream, you become really afraid. Then you wake up and it's like, oh, that was just a dream. No more fear. In the same way, when you realize Brahman, you go, oh, well, this world is just an appearance. I guess I have to tell the story of my enlightenment experience. I shouldn't say it's an experience, but I, I should call it maybe a vision. Well, that's not the right word either. <laughs> maybe I should tell the story of my enlightenment, period. <laughs> Back in 1984, I had spent quite some time at Osho Rajneesh's ranch in Oregon. And he never gave me any uh, service to do. I had complete freedom. Uh, it's, it's funny how that works. When I was with Prabhupada in ISKCON, he also never gave me any particular assignment other than chant. <laughs> So I was traveling everywhere and leading chanting and like that. And in Osho's group, uh, he never gave me anything to do. Uh, all I did was go to the meditations in the morning and evening. And in the rest of the day, I was free. So I would wander around in the desert or just sit in my room and meditate. And then... Of course, after a while, the other disciples became jealous, envious, and uh, threw me out. <laughs> but that was okay. I went back to my apartment in Portland, and I just sat. I had nothing to do. So I meditated. I started with, you know, four hours a day, and gradually worked my way up to like 12 to 16 hours a day of just sitting, Zen style. No agenda, no method, you know, uh, no particular style or way. Just sitting and watching. And 
the most amazing things started happening. It was so interesting. The changes that went on within. Gradually, the kundalini rose. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't trying to make it happen. It happened all by itself. And with none of the uncomfortable side effects that a lot of people mention about kundalini uh, meditation, because I didn't see myself as the doer. This was just happening naturally. So, of course, I let it happen. <laughs> it was great. And I could feel or see, actually, in a certain way, the kundalini rising up through the different chakras, enlivening them, and gradually coming to the agnya chakra, and then the crown chakra. And then one day, December 21st, 1984, I remember it like it was yesterday, I had taken a little break and made some lunch, just some organic ramen noodles, huh? simple lunch. And I was coming out of the kitchen and I felt a presence, like somebody was in the room. But of course, nobody was there. The doors and windows were all locked. <laughs> I was there all by myself, like I had been for the previous, I don't know, six weeks or so. Just sitting and sitting. But I could feel a presence, and it was a female presence a feminine energy in the room. And suddenly I felt a tap, a soft tap right on my third eye. And boom, suddenly I could see Brahman. I could see Brahman and the world superimposed on it, like both at the same time. It was really wild. And this was accompanied by a tremendous feeling of bliss. So this lasted for weeks. I guess, actually, I just got used to it because I still see that way. Not with the same intensity. You know, like anything new, huh? And when it first hits, it's like overwhelming. But then after a while, it becomes normal. So in the same way, I was blessed with this vision of Brahman that showed that the world, like the snake, was something simply superimposed on it and that it was not fundamentally real. This is the basic insight of Advaita Vedanta, although I didn't know it at the time. I was unlearned in the uh, complexities of this philosophy. I had to study for more than 30 years after that before I actually found the explanation of what had happened to me. And what you're getting now in this series is basically the reasoning behind it how enlightenment works, what enlightenment is, and how to approach it and realize it for yourself. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.